Hello, good evening, curious people of the internet. This is Seda Rodar speaking at the Entrepreneur's Kitchen. On the other side of the line, we have a phenomenal scientist today. He's young, but he's not only young, he's one of the 30 people, according to Forbes, who is changing 30 under 30 was <laughs> in 2015, uh, changing the face of the science and one of the top 10 people, top 10 game changers in the scientific world. He's a professor at Caltech University um, and he's a planetary science professor, Konstantin Batygin. Please welcome Konstantin. Hey, Konstantin. Hey, Sita, how are you doing? I'm really well. Thank you so much for joining the show. Uh, I want to start immediately with one question, Konstantin. We met in 2018 and you were just at the verge of presenting your latest findings. And since then, what new things happened? Uh, well, uh, you know, since 2018, I mean, 2018 feels like, uh, you know, just yesterday at the same time so long ago. Um, yeah, I mean, I've been concentrated really over the last year on um, a problem that might seem simple at the surface, but actually we know uh, surprisingly little about it. And the problem is, how did the moons of Jupiter form? Right? So Jupiter is the biggest planet of the solar system. It is the fifth one out, uh, the Earth being the third. It takes about 10 years to go around the sun, right? And perhaps the first astronomical discovery ever to be made, right? As soon as Galileo picked up the telescope and looked at the moon, he then looked at Jupiter and noticed that Jupiter had its own moons. So we've known about these moons for four centuries, but we don't really know how they form. So I've been focused a lot on trying to understand from a you know mathematical point of view, kind of constructing physical models for their formation. That's amazing. I mean, it looks like you have been discovering or making one scientific breakthrough after the other every year. How does that happen? <laughs> I just, you know, I, I keep wanting to get paid, you know, otherwise. I don't get <laughs> so it's all for money. <laughs> money is the only motivator. That's right. I have no other in, in astrophysics. That's the best because because money buys you the best beverages too. So what are we doing tonight or uh, this afternoon? <laughs> so we are doing uh, we're doing a premier three ingredient drink, uh, <laughs> one that you can one that one that you can afford even if you don't get paid too much, you know, <laughs> which is the Negroni. Um, yeah, so I. Um, also on campus, uh, Caltech, there's a, um, there's a bar that you can go to, uh, there's like a, it's like a faculty club. And I last year became close friends with the bartender who, who told me a secret. He said that the count, like Negroni, right, made his drink with three parts equal, right? You know, gin and uh, Campari and sweet vermouth all in equal proportion. But he said the if you want it to be better, then you have to alter the uh, the proportions a little bit so that there's more gin. So you, you can think of it as like one unit of gin, two thirds um, Campari and maybe one half uh, sweet vermouth. That's so. what we're going to do. I also prepared everything according to what you said. <laughs> so we'll have it. Um, by the way, I mean, it looks like even the um, even the drinks need certain mathematical calculations and proportions. Let's go back to uh, um, to the moons of uh, Jupiter. So, why is it so important to understand how they form? Well, that's a great question, actually. So, you know, if you look at where we're going in the next uh, decade or two. In terms of where the space missions are going, right? So mm -hmm. the, the, the uh, NASA spacecraft, ESA spacecraft, the, the focus in the next decade and a half, or maybe even two decades, are the icy satellites of the solar system. So ESA is sending a, um, a mission to Ganymede, which is the biggest moon of Jupiter called JUICE. Um, mm -hmm. and 
NASA is sending a mission to Europa, which is a somewhat smaller moon of Jupiter called Europa Clipper, and another mm -hmm. mission called Dragonfly, which is going to be a drone that's going to fly around the moon of Saturn uh, called Titan. So you might say, why? What's the focus? Why, you know, suddenly, why the interest in the outer moons? And the answer is that they are the best candidates for finding life in the solar system that is not on Earth. We've looked oh. for life on Mars over the last, you know, really 20 years, more than that, with, with rovers, and Mars is a dead planet. We don't know how life forms, right? But I think it's, you would agree that it's one of the maybe very few truly dramatically important uh, questions of science, right? Finding life somewhere else in the universe would be a dramatic alteration of our understanding of the cosmos and indeed everything else. So um, the satellites of the giant planets are actually prime candidates. And um, if you are going to, you know, the, the question of their origin is actually part of this whole, uh, it, it intervenes into the quest for life outside mm -hmm. of the, the earth and more generally an understanding of how you know, celestial bodies form. Um, when you when you say finding life, what kind of life are you referring to? Because as far as I know, uh, since you know uh, a lot of those planets or moons, they they don't have an atmosphere, which makes everything very difficult. So when when we talk about life, are we talking about a life where you know plants can grow and we can thrive, or what what sort of a life are we referring to? So this is not life where we can survive. But remember, on the Earth itself, mm -hmm. life did not start on the surface. And the atmosphere that we breathe today would have been toxic to life when it started, you know, uh, three or so billion years ago. Because oxygen ah. is not particularly uh, pleasant for, for most life. So if you think about the origin of life, life comes from water. As far as we can tell, water is a necessary ingredient and liquid water. Yeah. Um, where is there liquid water in the outer solar system? Well, the answer is that Europa, this, this second moon of, of Jupiter, is mostly water, right? It's got a rocky core and a giant ocean and an ice shell. So it, if there is life in Europa, then it will be, you know, something that lives in the ocean underneath the icy shell. And also it's, it's a place that is very inhospitable to creatures like us because you're sitting in the radiation environment of Jupiter, which is a, which is a rather tough uh, place to be. So it's a, um, yeah, it's remarkably, it's fascinating stuff. It is totally fascinating. And, and, you know, my mind just goes totally astray in terms of sci-fi. So, if do you ever imagine what sort of creatures or you know for, for bodies one might find? I think it's a hundred percent dolphins. Just I think <laughs> dolphins. dolphins is like when you when you look at evolution and say where does it end when you've reached the ultimate state? It's definitely a dolphin. Really? Is it serious? <laughs> <laughs> You got me for one second. I'm like, seriously? <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, <laughs> definitely dolphins. So on search for dolphins on, you know, Jupiter's moons, before that you discovered the, uh, or you replaced our notion of planet nine. Let's talk about that a little bit. For sure, for sure. Yeah, so um, of course, you know, the story of, of the solar system's markup is an evolving one always. You go back sufficiently far, meaning, you know, the 1800s, people used to think there were 15 planets, then it came down to eight and so on. Uh, but, you know, something that I think a lot of us learned in the textbooks is that the solar system has nine planets all the way out to Pluto. And really, uh, if you ask yourself, does Pluto fall into the same category of body as everything else? It, it really doesn't. It's tiny. It's, uh, in fact, Pluto's, uh, you know, Pluto's surface area is 
is almost exactly equal to that of Russia, right? So it's, it's really oh. quite a, I mean, Russia is big, but in a celestial body sense, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's tiny, maybe, okay. <laughs> doesn't qualify as its, as its own planet. Um, so, <laughs> Although on earth it does. <laughs> yeah, and you know, there, there are other analogies to be made, like it's super cold, like Pluto is really cold, right? As is Russia. Um, you know, yeah, so the analogies continue. But look, um, you know, so as a consequence of that, back in 2006, the astronomical community decided to demote uh, Pluto and the solar system went back to be having eight planets. Now, what we discovered uh, about a decade after that, in 2016 or so, and we were really inspired by a lot of the work that had come uh, before us, there were, there were other scientists looking at the same thing. Uh, Chatter here and Scott Shepard, for example, had pointed something out really weird in the outer solar system. But what we noticed is that uh, if you look at the most distant orbits that you can see that, that are cataloged, um, they all point in the same direction, right? And they all lie roughly in the same plane. So it's as if some distant gravitational pull is, is sculpting together the, the distant orbits of the solar system. And you know, from there on, we kind of followed that, that thread uh, of logic. And as it turns out, there, there's a number of lines of evidence that are purely gravitational for now that point to the existence of an additional massive ninth planet, something that is uh, five Earth masses or so on an orbital period that takes 10,000 years to go around the sun. So the, the wow. search is on for planet nine, but of course right now due to coronavirus, the search is off because none of the telescopes are working. <laughs> oh man, so, um, so you know that it's there, but you haven't seen it yet. That's right, that's right. So you know, here an analogy uh, actually can be made with the discovery of Neptune a little bit. So Neptune itself was discovered mathematically first. It was discovered by Arbonne de Verrier um, in 1846 through its gravitational pull on Uranus. So you could tell that Uranus was not following the trajectory it was supposed to follow. And as a consequence, Le Verrier did a very nice and uh, complicated, but in the end, correct set of calculations, which mm. demonstrated that the solar system must have had an eighth planet. So, but, I mean, what are the consequences? If, if we are able to, oh, by the way, I'm uh, totally forgetting to let people know the Salida code. It's 51515, what a number. <laughs> So, so we're on slide at so, and the random number we got today is 51515. So if you guys have any questions in the next 15 minutes, you, it's your shot to ask. Um, so what is the consequence of, uh, you know, it's been, it's been like, I don't know, maybe something like a hundred years since the last discovery of a, of a planet. And now you yeah. come um, and, and you say, you know, and your team and, um, so, so what is the reaction in the scientific community and what are the consequences uh, for our understanding of the universe? Well, so uh, as far as the reaction in the scientific community uh, goes, I think it's been uh, really interesting. You know, there's been a lot of excitement over this. There have been people trying to come up with their mm -hmm. own models of figuring out how Planet Nine affects the solar system. There have been other people who have been considering other alternative explanations, you know, mm -hmm. uh, for maybe it's not a planet, maybe it's a field of, you know, massive debris that is cumulatively five Earth masses, you know, so there's been a lot of activity where people have been really kind of coming at this problem from different angles. There's one team that said, actually, maybe it's not a planet at all, maybe it's a primordial black hole. Um, you know, which is, so it's, it's generated a lot of interesting uh, research, which I think is, is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, as far as what it will mean for uh, our understanding of the solar system, you know, if we, or, or really anybody, by we I mean the cumulative we, uh, discover planet nine anytime soon, it will completely redefine the scale of the solar system, right? We will, um, 
we will stop thinking of you know 30 astronomical units, 30 times the distance between the Earth and the Sun is kind of the, the end of the massive bodies. But the, the other important angle here is that, as it turns out, five Earth mass planets are the most common type of object in the universe as, well, as far as we can see, certainly in the galaxy. Most planets that around other stars that we have discovered are about five Earth masses. In the solar system, for now, we don't have access to looking at what does a typical galactic planet look like. This would be, if we find planet nine and are able to interrogate it, to study it directly, that will be our link to understanding the most common type of planet throughout the galaxy. And I think that's really exciting. That I, I'm, I'm, yeah, as I said, my mind is just blowing right now with all sorts of questions. So what would be one scientific breakthrough for you, by the way, Tiers, <laughs> sure. um, um, where you would say, okay, now we're at a stage that we can, you know, go where no man has gone before. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, really, I, I have a hard time answering that in any simple way because at least in my experience, science doesn't work like that. Science, we, we tend to write the history of science as a sequence of these jumps in understanding, right? Like people had this notion of a, I don't know, geocentric universe and then Copernicus came and said, no, the sun is the center and everyone realized, but it doesn't actually work like that. The science is an iterative process where it's, it basically works by people making mistakes and other people pointing out that those are mistakes. Um, so as a, as a result, you know, there's, there's never really a moment uh, in, my, in my mind where, where you would say, aha, this is something that where our understanding would jump from zero to infinity. Um, you know, some discoveries are basically inevitable. And uh, there, it's very, it's not often that you have a development which is, which truly relies on the genius of one person. Actually, mm -hmm. re general relativity is uh, one example of that. General relativity was really, you know, the work of Einstein himself, but special relativity, his earlier theory um, was really not just him, it was mm -hmm. him, Lorenz, Poincaré, there's a number of people all working in the same direction. And I think that even if not for Einstein, special relativity would have been figured out. You know, so mm -hmm. I don't know, this is a long-winded answer, but uh, all of this said, I'm super excited for Finding Planet Nine. Yeah, well, it's amazing. Um, I mean, your, your answer just right now uh, brings a, a very important point um, of collaboration. And also, as far as I'm informed, uh, you know, we once we visited one of the uh, Austrian uh, uh, telescopes here, which is close by Salzburg, um, and there we were informed that um, you rely a lot on citizen science. So not only collaboration between the scientific community, but also people who are uh, willing to understand and help uh, further this. So what, what is your opinion in, in terms of uh, citizen science? Yeah, I think it has a, uh, it definitely has its uh, place and it has been really useful in certain disciplines, of, a certain sort of sub-disciplines of um, astronomy. Good example is um, analysis of, uh, so looking for extrasolar planets. Right, mm -hmm. there are times when you have so much data, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I, we're kind of in that state now with uh, various uh, space telescopes. You have so much data that you can't hope to go through all of it, and, mm -hmm. and so you then give the uh, you know you rely on the help from the general public to help you chug through that data and discover see if you discover something interesting. Mm -hmm. um, postdoc, uh, Juliet Becker, uh, who, when she was a graduate student, um, wrote an, a very influential paper that was, uh, that originated from a discovery that a citizen scientist made. The citizen scientist noticed that there was something 
uh, interesting about one particular star that its light, its brightness was dipping every few days. And the reason, as it turns out, is that there was a planet that was going, you know, and eclipsing the star every few days. So they discovered, uh, you know, these, and it turned out to be more than just one, you know, a discovery of a planet. It turned out to be that this particular system uh, was, um, at least at the time, one of a kind. And it was kind of the tip of an iceberg. So mm-hmm. I think, uh, you know, citizen science, scientists have, have a huge role to play. Not in every, you know, not in every subdiscipline. Like looking for Planet Nine is at the edge of what telescopes can do anyway. So there, it's we're not in a state where we have so much data that we need somebody to look mm-hmm. through it. But there are uh, there are interesting collaborations that can be made. That's really interesting because that brings us also to my next question around creativity. Uh, what does a usual day for a scientist like yourself look? Uh, what is the role of creativity in your day-to-day work? Well, I try to make it to 12 o'clock and then at 12 o'clock just start drinking those Negronis. You know? <laughs> well done, mister. <laughs> uh, that's, that's typical every day. So you also you also uh, advocate uh, you know mind opening prescription medicine like Negroni. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's I mean it's um, you know in the in the life of you know of course not every scientist has the same you know job but being a professor at Caltech you know I my job is kind of split between teaching and, and research. And so, um, you know, there, as far, what, the way I see it is, um, you know, I have maybe three primary responsibilities. One is to teach classes, right? Which I do, um, in fact, you know, in 40 minutes, I'm teaching a class on, on planet formation. So that's one uh, thing, that's kind of like a basic responsibility. The other is to, um, advise graduate students and undergraduates. So I have Mm -hmm. a a group um, of students that, students and postdocs that work with me. Um, So my group is not, you know, definitely not the biggest on campus, but I have about six people um, in my group at the moment. And um, finally, you know, there's another, you know, chunk of time that goes to my own personal research where, you know, it's not something where I'm, it's a project that the student is leading or the postdoc is leading and I'm helping. It's, it's really my own work. And, mm. um, you know, I try to make sure that as I go through my career, I always have time and I also always have the mental ca- kind of capacity to do my own work. I think it's really important. It keeps you both uh, you know, connected to what the interesting things are uh, in mm. the field and also keeps your skills sharp because just like uh, anything, if you don't use it, you lose it. Absolutely. And also, you know, I remember reading the New York Times article from just a few days ago, and there is an interesting story about how you suddenly were able to connect the dots uh, by just looking at what was happening around you, right? So you have to be also kind of open and we love those stories, of course. <laughs> um, but another another aspect of you is the music. Yeah, sure, yeah. I, um, yeah. I, that's right. So, well, I mean, I, yeah, go, go ahead, sorry. No, so, so I wanna, I wanna uh, uh, know about the role of music if, if it kind of, uh, I don't know, helps you into some sort of mental state or uh, or do you see science and music more separated from each other? No, I, I see them as very much intertwined and it's something I think I could not have used a better description than what you said of helping, you know, playing music helps uh, attain a certain mental state. I've never been able to really understand it uh, very well or kind of engineer it because at the end of the day, all that happens, the only observations that I've made about myself is that um, if, you know, work gets like day-to-day work gets too much and uh, and I end up doing too much just kind of uh, stuff that's, uh, that's functional, 
then of course, inevitably, my creativity during that time drops. And mm -hmm. uh, the only way to bring back the creativity is to play music. So I, I try to make sure that I, you know, play on an almost every day, uh, even if it's a little bit, I try to play guitar almost every day. Um, I also like it, you know. I also like so, <laughs> you have a band? I do, yeah, I have an awesome band. Uh, I have a band, in fact, right now, everybody in the band is an astronomer, so. Uh, <laughs> How awesome, really yeah. cool. So what is the band called? The band's called The Seventh Season. Um, okay. And, and like the Monstein album. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah we, <laughs> oh my god, I don't, I don't believe that I know that fact. <laughs> <laughs> my husband is just cracking right now in the next room. He's like, she knows this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe this. Yeah, I think there is a song actually by Indy Monstein on there. You're such a there. metal nerd. <laughs> a metal nerd, yeah. Well, actually, <laughs> we're almost at the end. Uh, therefore, I want to ask you a couple of questions um, that are already, you know, um, uh, raining in Slido. So let's try to kind of keep short and creative. Um, are your findings based on simulations or actual data? Both. Both. Well, that was a perfect answer. Um, would the discovery of life on another planet not disrupt the whole premise of Earthlings? God. Therefore, humans reason for being. So if we were to discover life on a different planet, uh, that would screw the humanity up, someone says. <laughs> well, uh, certainly, I think there, there, might, be, there might be some uh, members of humanity who might have a problem with it. But you know, I think we have to let go of a pre-scientific notion of God anyway. I think that, you know, mm -hmm. A god, which is a person who sits on a cloud and occasionally rains down thunder, <laughs> is, is one that's incompatible with our daily reality. But you could you could find spirituality uh, in a different aspect of this uh, of this uh, vision, which is you know you the universe and just the world around us has laws, right? The laws of physics are actually remarkably symmetric and remarkably beautiful and you might maybe ask a question of you know i think a better place to find spirituality is in trying to understand the rules by which this world works rather than to imagine a micromanager who is trying mm -hmm. to you know kind of uh ensure that you know all of us don't get into trouble at least that's that's my <laughs> that's my view yeah, where, where he's not or she's not necessarily doing an excellent joke. So that's also, <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> oh, oh my God, what would Pope Francis say? <laughs> uh, I, I think, um, you know, I think we should, we should have him on the show. I, I think it's, uh, we should, I don't know, do they have Zoom and Vatican? I presume they have Zoom. They have like, pretty good yeah wifi. they they probably already passed that stage and they can just you know beam. <laughs> well um there is actually a funny question um you're an astronomer is your wife an astrologer <laughs> you know some days some days yes she is uh, yeah. <laughs> that's hilarious actually there are a couple of questions around astrology so uh that's not the same thing. <laughs> Everybody knows it. But um, do you do you sometimes get into these weird conversations with astrologers? Does that ever happen? Not really. Uh, okay. Partially because I try to stay away from astrology uh, conversation because so I actually I don't want I don't want to say negative things about astrology as a historical as a historical thing. Because, mm -hmm. you know, right now, astronomy and astrology are very, very different. But if you go back to the ninth century, for example, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, ask, you know, how were, um, you know, decisions made back then? Or, I mean, astronomy and, and astrology were, were interrelated things. I think mm -hmm. it has been a few years since I, since I studied this in detail, but I think that the building of Baghdad actually was 
uh, in part influenced by the alignment uh, of like so the geometry of how Baghdad was built was influenced by the geometry of the alignment of stars. So oh, wow. there's a historical uh, you know historical wealth really of uh, of information where astrology can be viewed as a beautiful thing, just like I don't know, just like mythology, like ancient Greek mm -hmm. mythology is a beautiful thing to study, right? I don't worry too much about Hades or Zeus or anything like that <laughs> on a daily basis, just like I don't worry about astrology. Yeah, awesome. One last question and then we go, we, we go to the end. And that question really is interesting because it also interests me. What does Kepler mean when he talks about harmony of the spheres? Is he saying music and movement of planets are connected? Yeah, that was something that Kepler uh, had in mind that perhaps the the you know orbital uh, the orbits of planets can make chords basically. Um, there, the solar system is not really a great example of this, but there are other uh, planetary systems. In fact, Jupiter's moons are one example where they do make chords because for every full revolution of Io. Europa makes two and Ganymede makes one. So there are these integer harmonic relationships between planets that are called resonances. So um, Kepler, I think, uh, you know, the, the Keplerian way of thinking about it is not, it is obsolete, but there are still hints of that same type of idea uh, present in astronomy today. That kind of is actually really beautiful to think about. Um, well, we're almost at the end. Um, and now we come to the, uh, you know, my funny, my, my funny part of the closing of the show. Um, and I'm really wondering what a, uh, what an astronomer <laughs> would tell as a joke. <laughs> I asked uh, you, you had one, so I'm looking forward to hearing it, and then I'll, I'll crack mine. <laughs> all right, sounds good. So uh, you, you take a physicist and a mathematician, and you ask both, how would you go about boiling water? And the physicist says, well, you have to put water in a kettle and then turn on the fire, put uh, the kettle on top of the fire, and then it boils, right? They're very good. They asked the mathematician, how would you do it? And he said, yeah, the same thing. You put water in the kettle, kettle on the fire, it boils. And he said, aha, but what if the fire is already on? And the physicist says, well, it's the same thing. You put water in the kettle, you put kettle on the fire, it boils. The mathematician says the solution is to turn off the fire such that this problem reduces to the previous problem. mathematics joke too oh awesome yeah but mine are by no i mean yeah it's very easy to get okay why was six afraid of seven because <laughs> seven eight nine oh, oh. <laughs> oh nice okay that was <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can tell this to your kids. They get it. <laughs> well, I'll tell this to my class. And, uh... Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Constantin, this was a delight. If you have five more minutes, just please stay in the line while I'm saying goodnight to everyone. This has been a delightful, awesome week. I've learned so much. And I want to thank again, Constantin, for joining me today from Caltech. Next week... <laughs> A whole awesome another week is expecting you, me, in my kitchen. I'm looking forward. Have a great weekend. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Bye-bye.